Jennifer Burris, I'm the Jackson County Community Justice Director. Tina is not able to make it today, so as the Vice Chair, I'll go ahead and move us forward with the meeting. Um, first, if you don't mind, I think uh, it would be beneficial to go around the room and introduce ourselves. So, okay. want to start, Barbara? Sure. Thank you, Katie. I'm Barbara Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of Community Works, and we provide services for anyone victimized with domestic or sexual violence or trafficking. Josh Aldrich, I'm the jail commander. Uh, Jeff Kirkpatrick, and I'll introduce myself later when I speak to you. Our keynote. I'm Justin Ivins, Chief of Police with Upper. We're the Harris County Commissioner, and I was asked to tell you that Danny uh, Jordan had a doctor's appointment, so couldn't make it today. I'm Travis Christian, Vice President of Direct Construction. I'm Doug Engel. I work at the Public Defender's Office. I have one more meeting, and then Clint Oborn, who's right over here, will be taking over for me. Okay. And in the back. Bobby Devine, I'm the Deputy Director of the Transition Center. Joe Ferguson, Deputy Director for Juvenile. Jason Peterson, I'm the Emergency Manager for the VA. Sarah Panapinski, Tri-County Court Coordinator and Area Manager for Max's Mission. Doug Houston, Jackson County Mental Health. And Sarah Hubbard, Deputy Director of Adult Probation. Mike Parson, City of Central Points City Council, and also CPPD. The direct volunteer director of the volunteer program and training. Great. And then uh, for the folks on Zoom, I think the best way is I'll just um, call you by your first name. And if you can identify uh, who you are and where you're, uh, what agency you're with, that'd be great. So let's start with Jennifer. Hi, I'm Jennifer Lind. Oh, sorry, Jennifer. Oh, Jennifer Lind, <coughs> it's you. Sorry. I'm Jennifer Lind, and I'm with Jackson Care Connect. Hilda? Hi, hello everyone. My name is Hilda Montenegro Fix and I am the CEO of Celebrate Diversity. Sheriff? Nate Sigler, Dex County Sheriff. Jennifer? Jennifer Malani Casa of Jackson and Justin County. David? David Carter, Southern Oregon University. Rita? Rita Solomon, I'm a clinical psychologist. Stacy? Stacy Brubaker, I'm the department director for Jackson County Health and Human Services. Well, welcome. Uh, I believe that Marcy sent the minutes out from the last meeting from April, so um, I hope everyone had a chance to review those. I would entertain a motion to approve those minutes. I move to approve the minutes of the last meeting. Thank you. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion, changes, or additions to those meetings? Minutes? All right, all those in favor, please signify aye. by saying aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Yeah. Any, could you do the other people? Sorry. Any opposed? Sorry. No. Did they all say aye? Okay. Any abstain? All right, the Aye. Oh, David. Yes. Okay, motion passes, thank you. So um, today that we have the livability team presenting. Um, Lieutenant Kirkpatrick with Medford PD is here and I'd like for Chief Ivins to recognize and introduce him for us. You ready for us? We are. All right. <clears throat> I just want to take a minute, um, we're going to have some changes with uh, some leadership at our department at the start of the month, and um, Jeff will be moving up to our administration lieutenant, uh, and Rebecca Pietala will be moving into community engagement and taking over Jeff's role. So I just want to take a second to recognize Jeff. Um, livability team started in 2019 under uh, Chief Scott Clausen. And it was basically, here you go, Jeff, take this and run with it. And he was a sergeant at that time. And his work has transformed this team and made it what it is today. His work has, um, and his leadership has truly impacted thousands of lives in the Rogue Valley. And I want to recognize him with the Chief's coin. This will be his last, probably his last presentation uh, in regards to the livability team. And I just want, and I just want to thank him. Uh, for that, uh, that, uh, that work that he has done. 
So congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, with that, we'll kick it off. If you want to start that slideshow. So we'll talk about, uh, I, I know that none of you in your roles in what you do, and I know most everybody in this room, but none of you in your roles um, ever have to deal with anything relating to homelessness. So this will be a brand new topic <laughs> to each and every single one of you. Um, and, and, and I'm excited to step into a new role, but it is something that I'm very comfortable with. So doing this since late 2019 and just having every ounce of my energy really for the last few years really devoted to how do you solve the issues surrounding homelessness? Now, we're not going to solve, no one in this room individually nor collectively, will we probably solve homelessness, right? We're not going to solve. Um, but can we solve some of the symptoms that affect our community? And can we take steps in making people's lives better? A hundred percent, like each and every person in this room has the ability to affect that change a little bit. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about our livability team, how we implemented it, why we implemented it, the stages that we've gone through, because believe it or not, it changes once a week um, in our response, whether it's state mandates, whether it's local politics, whether it's county politics, whether it's money, it changes. Const it's just a constantly changing and evolving uh, thing. It's a, it's a living, breathing entity. Um, and so we'll talk about what our livability team is um, and the stages of that little intro into who I am. So I, again, Jeff Patrick, I'm a Lieutenant currently with the Medford police department, and I am in charge of our community engagement division. Our, the community engagement division really houses all the non-traditional, uh, non-traditional, uh, entities of police work at the Medford police department. So our, uh, kind of the, the traffic division, photo radar, school resource officers, um, uh, our volunteers, the code enforcement team and our livability team. So it, it, houses, it houses a lot of non-traditional things. It's not the patrol division or the investigations division. It's this thing that we created to kind of capture all the other stuff that we do as a police department. And um, we are a very full service police department. We, we kind of have our hands in everything. And that, uh, when it comes to homelessness, like how engaged should the police be in homeless issues? Um, and the answer is really that we, we, we answer to the citizens. We answer to what they expect from us. And the, and the city of Medford and the citizens in the city of Medford expect your police department to be the ones on the forefront of doing this. Um, and so that kind of gets us into why this, why this started. Um, I'm going to start us off with a bit of a, with a video that was kind of a PSA video that we started with. Uh, a couple of years ago when we tried to get out in front of some things that were happening um, with certain portions of our uh, community that were unhappy with us um, and, and doing the work that we do. So I'm just going to start this video and then we'll get into some other stuff. The livability team is a group of officers that are selected based on kind of on, a, on certain characteristics of compassion, hard work, outside the box thinking, and really with an aim to address some of the issues, uh, both behaviorally and societally, that we see with kind of a burgeoning homeless population here in Medford. And when the team was formed, we looked at like, what really, are, what are we trying to affect? What change are we trying to affect? And how are we trying to work with the homeless and the homeless service providers? And what is our role as a police department in that? And what we found is that the most effective way for us to interact in that community is really to be that broker of resources, to be the boots on the ground in the camps, creating relationships with the homeless, creating relationships with our service providers, and then trying to marry the two. So that's really what that team has become. The livability team has given us a chance to find these people. The livability team has built, developed relationships with these people so they know where they are, they know where we can find them and these people can actually begin engaging in treatment in a way that wasn't, you know, traditionally there. Our patients know the livability team officers and they have a great relationship with them and they know them by first name. And a lot of our patients, they do depend on things um, being passed through that are also just rides or just general information sometimes that we're not able to pass on right away. So definitely have a great relationship with them. 
And it's really about creating relationships. You continue to build trust, you continue to kind of break down those barriers, and then once you do that, you're able to kind of figure out what those things are that are holding people back in their own journey to recovery, whether it's mental health recovery, whether it's substance abuse disorder recovery, or whether it's just general needs in life. What are those things that we can do to break those down and how can we bring other people in to kind of fill those roles? Homelessness has always been a part of my life and uh, it's not something I've always wanted to admit. I went from pretty girl rock with fancy clothes that I stole from the stores to push cart homeless in zero to 60 seconds. My hair matted to my head. Um, it would be like looking at me now and then blinking your eye and all of a sudden I was that girl again, that girl screaming on the sidewalk and that's where the livability team found me. Um, screaming on the sidewalk outside the Kelly shelter. They just put me on the path to be able to get into this place, I took the test, and lo and behold, uh, January 3rd, I got my acceptance letter and I started school. The work that's being done by that group of people is really incredible. And as I watch policemen kneel down and talk to people, as I watch them try to create these relationships, as I see from start to finish people who are living in ditches and tents with needles spilling out of the tent and just these really abhorrent conditions, and now I have watched them step through different progressions into being productive members of society and they're, they've got full-time jobs, they're going to college, they're doing all these really amazing things. Um, that's really satisfying. The livability team itself started in September of 2019, really in response to some things that we were seeing as, the, as our homeless population started to grow. And for those of you who have been around this valley for a long time like I have, you've seen a transition just visually in our homeless community, right? Like the ability to just drive down the seat and the street and see our homeless community growing, um, it, it's pretty apparent. And you don't need statistics, you don't need point in time count numbers to tell you that that's what's happening. Like you can do that on your way to work. Um, and we started seeing that in the, you know, the 2017, 2018 timeframe. And then what we started to see was behaviors along our Greenway and our downtown area that were really concerning. And so city council decided back in 2019 that they wanted to, uh, they, they charged the police department with developing a team of officers to, officers to really deal with the behaviors that we were seeing from the folks um, in that community. So they gave us some measurable objectives. They wanted us to do what police officers do, which is enforcement. They wanted us to go out and enforce the laws. They wanted us to uh, coordinate with our code enforcement folks and to really work on our neighborhood livability partnership. Like our, if we have a, a, a drug house in a neighborhood, uh, we would use uh, the neighborhood livability partnership, which is this multidisciplinary team of people that got together and really addressed that home, right? So you had P&P, &P, you had us, you had DHS, you had a bunch of different entities come together and from a multidisciplinary approach, really attack that problem. They wanted us to kind of coordinate that part of it. And then the last portion of that was to connect people to resources. Um, and it really was the smallest part of that three piece puzzle. And we were gonna just have one of our CSOs uh, assigned to the connection of resources thing. And what we quickly started to realize early on was that that was kind of the most important piece because you can't simply enforce your way out of homelessness for, for a, a variety of reasons. Um, just arresting people for the behaviors is not going to change their stead in life. Simply connecting them to resources and giving them things is not going to change that outcome. You have to kind of marry the two. Uh, and the way that we did it um, was kind of unique. So, uh, originally, and what we were funded for and what we created as a, as a police department was the, a team of a sergeant who was in charge of the livability team and our code enforcement, but you had a sergeant, he had a corporal working on that team, three police officers, a full-time community service officer, and our community service officers, their uniform in slightly different uniforms, they have enforcement powers of violations of Medford Municipal Code, but they're not sworn cops. Uh, they don't enforce uh, or to revise statutes. Um, and then we had two part-time CSOs that were assigned to that team and a support specialist who has been probably the biggest vital piece 
It was a, a record specialist who came over and is now the support specialist of that team. And she uh, is incredible. Her name's Michaela. Uh, just absolutely kills it. Um, so we create that team and we kind of go forth. And early on, we were like, hey, uh, we don't know what we're doing. We showed up in September of 19 and we all kind of looked at each other like, all right, what do we do? And we didn't know. We just went out and swung the bat, swung the bat. We failed a lot. Um, we figured out a lot of things really early on of stuff that we couldn't do. We got, you know, we, we coordinated people getting into housing and we gave them keys with no support services on the back end. And next thing you know, two weeks later, they're kicked out of the house for behavior. Like, oh, that doesn't work. You have to do a bunch of other things. And so we started really learning these lessons early on of the things that did work and didn't work. And we had a balance. And I like to talk in two very distinct um, errands with this team, the pre-prohibited camping enforcement and post-prohibited camping enforcement. So prior to May 2021, the city of Medford had a prohibited camping statute um, that was very broad. Uh, you can't camp anywhere in the city of Medford with a tent. Like, that's kind of what the statute read. Um, what happened was that a couple of different case laws came by, and a, a lot of you know these, but the Martin v. Boise case, and then another um, a decision out of the Grants Pass case that was heard here uh, locally with the, the, the U.S. court. Both kind of said that, that cities, and I'm going to butcher this a little bit, but because I'm not an attorney and I'm not that smart, uh, is that cities can't broadly prohibit camping. Like you can't just broadly say you can't camp in the city, period. But you can regulate time, manner, and place. So we enacted the new statute post uh, Boise decision in May of 2021. So before that, our health and safety uh, Greenway team would go out and do what were commonly referred to as sweeps. They would post the entire Greenway and then they would go overnight and they would get people out of their tents and um, they would then clean. Um, that was found to not be okay by the court system. So we had to really adjust the way that we did that. So um, when the livability team started, we really tried to balance, um, that's what I'm trying to show here in the slide, is a balance between enforcement and outreach where we're, we're doing enforcement, we're doing things like tar targeting the behavior that we're seeing, we're doing bike stings, like where we have a bait bike and we would get people for stealing that bait bike and we'd be able to exclude them from the Greenway or from the downtown area. We would uh, use our, our exclusion ordinance pretty liberally in the fact that we would, um, when we contacted people for, for certain crimes, we would uh, exclude them from these areas. Um, a lot of bicycle patrols, um, so we would do a lot of enforcement and then we started really trying to establish what outreach looked like. What did it look like um, connecting people to resources? Um, that meant that our cops really had to learn a system that they were not familiar with. They're not social workers. They didn't know uh, the continuum of care system. They didn't understand how that stuff worked. And so they really had to, to learn it. They had to, uh, inject themselves into that environment and figure it out. And what that really meant was creating relationships with our service providers and really getting to know the people that worked in that business and how that, that end of things worked. Uh, and not only creating relationships with our service providers, but creating relationships with the homeless too. And we talk about a little bit in that video. Um, if they don't trust you and trust that you have their best interest at heart, they're not going to accept the things that you offer them. Um, and so it really became about the way that we interacted with our homeless population was really important um, and really vital. Uh, started to come up with some long-term solutions and learning from our failures and successes. And we were kind of off and running. Uh, this was the pre-prohibited camping area or era. Um, we created, along the lines of the outreach part of it, I talked about our neighborhood livability partnership. And we decided, man, if, if we can do this multidisciplinary approach to houses and problem areas and problem businesses, um, why can't we do it with people? And so we created our uh, CHOP program. So the Chronic Homeless Outreach Partnership was modeled after our NL NLP group. And we, instead of taking properties, we took people. 
And then we invited, there's a lot of people in this room or organizations in this room that are part of our CHOP that come together and we meet once a month and we case manage or casework individuals. We chose them really based on a variety of factors, but a big part of it was how much impact, how much negative impact is this individual having on the community? How often are they going to the hospital? How often are they utilizing mercy flights? How often are they use, utilizing fire services, police services, calls for service? And we took these folks and we would try to holistically look at the problem and address it and then ask people uh, in that room to really pick up the pieces uh, from the drug addiction standpoint, the mental health standpoint, and then us kind of taking the lead on coordinating that resource. Um, and it became pretty effective with the idea that if you take 10 people a month and you casework them and you kind of solve them from that point of view, then you're affecting change on 120 people a year. And that's a, that's a big number in a city like that. Um, and so that became a very successful program. I'm going to stop just for a second. When I, when I talk, I don't, it's really important to me that if questions pop up in your head at the time, just ask me that. Um, I like interaction and I like conversation a lot more than I like lecturing. Um, again, you don't want to listen to me lecture for another 45 minutes. So as questions come up, as things pop up, please interrupt me, raise your hand. I have, I love to answer those questions. Go ahead. Yeah, on that note, you were talking about building trust in relationships. And one thing that we know is there is a lot of existing stigma, right? And so yeah. just in your experience in the building of those relationships, in dealing with the negative stigma that police and a lot of the houses people, you know, already have, how do you bridge that gap? And what have been successful tools that you use in order to build those relationships that are lasting and successful? Yeah. It in, in any relationship, the ability to, 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 to build trust lies in, in having integrity and doing what you say you're going to do and treating people correct, treating people right. Um, and that's really what we impress upon the officers, specifically for all police officers at, at the Medford Police Department, but really specifically when it, when it deals with our houseless community and our livability team officers, like they know and we hire them, we bring them onto this team based on some characteristics that they already have. Not every police officer is cut out to be on this team, right? Uh, and we know that. And that doesn't mean that the other police officers are bad. It just doesn't mean that they don't have the qualities that we're looking for of the folks on this team. And so we're really hiring people that have the ability to connect on that level and have a, 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 a level of empathy. Yet at the, at the same time, they're able to balance that empathy with what we need to do as police officers, which is hold people accountable. That's what we do. That's what cops do. We hold people accountable. Right. It's our job. And, and I so guess that, that, yeah, go ahead. That understanding of the existing, like, this person might not like me yeah. and it has nothing to do with me, yep. right? But maybe an interaction they had with another police officer that was really harmful for yeah. them. Yeah, and we have to bridge that gap. Right. The good thing about this team is that with our patrol officers, they're so responsive, right? It's call to call to call. So they're on one call, then they go to another, then they go to another, then they go to, so they are trying, their brevity is really important to them. A lot of times, like it's it's important for them to be able to take time too, but they don't have that ability a lot of times. Our detectives, our livability team officers, the folks that are not married to the radio and police work have the ability to take a little bit more time um, and to kind of bridge those gaps. So it's really important and we see them every day. Um, so we're these, these folks, we know them by name. We know what their history is. We know the ins and outs of kind of their life a little bit. Um, and so the ability to, to connect with them is a little bit easier. Did you all have models from other cities that you could take some information from? So when you're, because you know, you're building something from the ground up. Right. Not really. I mean, kind of. There were other yeah, community action teams and homeless action teams throughout the state that we looked at. I've read a ton of books on it uh, on different places. And, and we did a lot of research early on in trying to come up with like, you know, where have other people failed and what can we learn from that or what do they do? But nobody that was doing this, everybody was doing for the most part, it was just teams that were doing mostly enforcement or teams that were doing no enforcement and just outreach. Got it. And so having the ability to kind of take that model. So uh, for those that want a good book, um, there's a book called San Francisco and it's written by a guy named Michael Schellenberger um, who, uh, Anyway, in his book, he talks about the ability to affect change on your homeless population, and he likens it to 
uh, he likens it to uh, the carrot and the stick model, right? In order for people to want to go into recovery, to take services, there has to be some sort of consequence on the back end for that, most of the time. Now, there are people who will absolutely take those services and take that path without the consequence piece of it. But in my experience in doing this for the last few years, the majority of people will not take that unless they are forced to because it's comfortable or because we've made it really easy as a society. And I, I hate saying like it's easy to live out of the greenway. That's not necessarily true, right? It's a very difficult life when we look at it through our perspective, but that's what they know. And if you're stepping out of something that you are comfortable in and something that you know to go down this road that's very difficult. Like drug, and, for those of you in here who work in that realm, substance abuse disorder treatment is very difficult for the individual. It's a hard thing to do. There has to be accountability on the other end. So, um, yeah, I hope that, did I answer your question? Yeah, and yeah I think We didn't really society, have a model. Uh, yeah. We just kind of made it up on our own. Yeah, I think our society has made it acceptable to be homeless. Correct, yeah. Not that it's Yeah, it's choice, not bad, it's not right. And, and, right. Like, we've made it acceptable. So I try not to get political when I talk, but you may, it may come out here and there. And that's just based on history of what I've seen. Uh, uh -oh. so you don't want to get political. It's, it's no, good. I'm, Rick, I'm good. Go ahead. Um, so you mentioned there needing to be some accountability. Do you find um, that sometimes incarceration, I know we don't want to go out and just arrest homeless people for behavior. That's not always the answer. But that is a tool. Um, and, and how can be effective, for one? Do you use that? Do you see that? And how has that tool been affected by like Measure 110 and um, and or I guess our lack of jail capacity? It's hmm. a great question. Um, <clears throat> arrest a lot of times arrest is the answer. Um, the I, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in depth later on when I talk about our municipal court bed program, what we're doing with the municipal court beds and how we're trying to model that. Um, there, there's definitely, and that's what I talk about with these, how it changes every every couple of weeks and how the way that we're going about things changes. But jail capacity, the ability to hold people accountable makes it very difficult for us to get people into, to get people on the right track. The uh, Our ability, one of the things that hampers us the most is accountability downstream from the police department. So the police department, our accountability only comes in handcuffs, right? Past that, past that entry point into the criminal justice system, it's on everybody else here, right? We arrest people, put them in custody, and then we have an expectation on the back end that there will be accountability to that person. Um, and so it can get frustrating at point, Measure 110 was huge um, for us. Uh, like the, <laughs> the ability to hold people accountable, um, that, we took a hit with that one. And, and you saw a, a large increase uh, in your homeless population, that and a couple other things that happened right at the same time. We're gonna, I'll go into those stats, but there was a perfect storm that happened in early, in, 20, in 2020. Like an absolute perfect storm of things. No, I'm sorry, early 2021. Um, that, it's hard, it's, it's, it's difficult. And, um, but I, I'll, I'll tell you what, our, and this isn't that I've had, so, so just so that you don't think I'm picking on Captain Aldrich, he and I have been best friends for years and years and years and years. We've had this, this conversation. It's not the jail's fault. Um, and I don't know necessarily that if you added seven to 9,000 beds at the jail, if we'd affect change simply in, in jail space, it's accountability. It's, it's the ability to prosecute. It's the ability to hold people accountable. Um, I don't know that the jail bed space thing solves that problem in and of itself. But that's, again, my take. Um, did I answer your question, Rick? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. So we talked about the CHOP. Um, these are really incredible meetings. Um, they're, in our, they're held in our Prescott room. There's probably sometimes 100 people in that room from different agencies. Um, these are all of the, the organizations that are part of our CHOP list. Um, being on our CHOP list is, a, is, is kind of a process because it requires a, we have a release of information uh, piece that has to happen for us to be able to share information back and forth. 
between service providers, um, HIPAA laws and Title 48 and all these other things that come into play when you want to talk about people's substance abuse problems or mental health problems. Um, we, these are the folks that primarily um, work with us or that we work with uh, on a on a day-to-day -day basis. This is not an all-inclusive list. There's a lot of organizations out there that we do partner with, but these are the folks who come to our shop and who we kind of ask to do certain things um, as a part of that group. So we started doing with our with our outreach, what we started doing was we would take members of our chop group and, and folks that we identified like Jackson County Mental Health, uh, ARC, Access, uh, veteran service folks. Um, I'm going to miss some, some people and I apologize if I don't say their names, but we would take these, these core service providers, uh, Rogue Retreat, uh, La Clinica, Mercy Flights, some folks that really um, put themselves out there and, and said they wanted to work with us on this outreach portion and we would take them and we'd take them two to three days a week out on their greenway into the community and we would put them in front of the client. Uh, we would make the introduction, the police officer would make the introduction because we know everybody. They would step back and try to allow the work to happen. And since, uh, since March of 2022, we've connected with 2,897 people out on the street. That, now, some of those are repeat, right? That's, that's just contacts. Some of those are repeat individuals, and uh, many of them are. So that's not 289, 2,897 individuals, but it's, it's contacts, uh, and some are multiple. But that's a big number of people that we have put service providers in front of out in the field. Because one of the things that we, we found early on is that if you just, the old model was to have a list of resources with an address and a phone number on it, and we would hand it to them and say, well, you know, on a card, and say, hey, here's a list of resources, you need to contact one of these folks. Common sense would tell you that that's not going to get results. Um, these folks, would have to leave their, the, the place where they have all their stuff. They'd have to take their, their, their mental health issues and their drug addiction issues with them, leaving their stuff behind, manage through getting to a location, and then work through getting those services. When we could just take them and put the people right in front. We've done telehealth appointments with, with providers, uh, doctors, having actual meetings in the field with the client. Um, we just found that it was a lot more productive to put the service provider in front of the person rather than require the person to go to the service provider because we just weren't seeing results doing it that way. Um, and so um, that's been a big part of what we do and we see a lot of, we see a, uh, we see all the, see a lot of benefit in that. Um, yeah, this is uh, some agencies that go with us, Access, Art, Mercy Flights, the Clinica, Options. Uh, options is a huge part for us and Jackson County Mental Health, another huge partner for us. Um, okay, so we talked about pre-May of 2021 and then post-May of 2021. Um, in early 2021, uh, Eric Mitten, our city attorney, uh, sat down with a bunch of us and we crafted a new prohibited camping st statute. And that went into, went through city council, was passed in early May of 2021 uh, based on a time, manner, and place uh, model of being able to say you cannot camp for this amount of time in this particular place in this manner. Um, and so our statute went into effect in, uh, in early 2021 and we started uh, prohibited camping operations. We went away from this whole sweeps model, sweeping everything, and we went on, we would take designated locations and work 10 to 15 camps a week. And so we would go out on, say, a Monday. Uh, the law required us, both state law and the case law required us to, to provide a certain amount of time from the time we posted to the time that we could actually clean the camp. Uh, if it's an established camp, uh, you have to give it 72 hours. So we would post on a Monday morning and then clean on Thursday. What would happen and what still happens in the model that, that, that we're really proud of is between that Monday, that Monday morning and that Thursday, we would be able to coordinate services to those individuals in those 10 to 15 camps um, and we saw some great results from that like hey here are your options come thursday here's the consequence and we started seeing a lot uh we started seeing a lot of results from that how do you determine an established camp 
Ah, it's a great question. It's something that was voted on by council two weeks ago. Um, so an established camp, if you want to put a timeline on it, has now been defined as anything that has been there le more than five days. How do you determine timeline? I don't determine that. Attorneys deter determine that. <laughs> so oh, you mean like, how do I establish if somebody's been there? Here's an example, or how long they've been there. A couple different ways. So if I go down, if, if our team goes down and clears, uh, does a prohibited camping operation at Hawthorne Park, and they know on Thursday, uh, let's say uh, last Thursday, so they, they do a cleanup of Hawthorne Park, there are zero camps in Hawthorne Park because they did a cleanup there. Right. They're all gone. So if you know that that area is clean and you document it via body cam, via video, via a bunch of other methods, you know that if anything pops up, it's been there less than five days. Like it's evidence that that's the case. You also, uh, conversations with people, people's admissions, uh, your knowledge of the area. So if I go down to Ninth Street and Almond, which is a kind of underneath the viaduct, which is a pretty heavy place for us. And I know that yesterday there were zero camps there and now there's a camp there. Evidence that that person's been there less than five days. So they have the ability to. Uh, we use uh, a lot of technology, and what we do with the livability team, they track everything. We developed an app in, in the ArcGIS system that captures a ton of information. So when we put ourselves, and we're going to talk about that here in a second, but we're able to take photographs into that app and know exactly what is going on in that place at that time uh, because we have it documented. And then we write reports on stuff. So we have documentation and we have the ability to say whether camp's been there. And then if we have any, any question as to whether or not that camp's been there five days or not, we err on the side of it's established. And then we'll start the 72 hour process with that camp. Um, so we started, uh, we started that model of uh, like a Monday posting and then 72 hours later, a Thursday cleanup uh, with really dedicated, um, outreach providing during those that course of days between Monday and Friday um, and saw some great results from that. Um, our model kind of changed at that point um, from really being this balance between enforcement to outreach to really being more on the prohibited camping operation and enforcement. End. We started seeing after months and months of doing this uh, of that model, 100%, not 100%, a large majority of the population uh, being resistant to accepting services. That was after about six months to a year of doing this model of offer on or a post on Monday, clean up on Thursday, coordinated services to those dedicated camps in between. We started seeing people stop interacting with us and our service providers and just saying, no, we're good, we're good, we're good. And then over and over and over again, telling us that they didn't want anything to do with the service providers. Mm -hmm. So we started using a lot more enforcement. Uh, we didn't, like in our first year of prohibited camping enforcement, I think that we only cited or arrested like between nine and 15 people for prohibited camping itself. We simply didn't have to. Uh, people would be, by the time we showed up on Thursday, we already knew who they were. We had, we had outreached them. We had connected them with places. We got there, their camp was gone and they had A, either moved somewhere else. They had gone with relatives. They had figured something else out um, or they had connected with services. Then we just started pe see, seeing people pick up their stuff and move it a little ways and mm -hmm. plop back down. And we, that was about a, six months to a year after we started this. And so we just started using a lot more enforcement. Um, and so, uh, and then we started ar ar arresting and or citing people a lot more for prohibited camping. And then we kind of got into this, this uh, area now where we are, uh, we have a contract with the jail where we have some municipal court beds that we're able to use. We're able to put people in those beds on a timeout and then coordinate services with them at the jail um, in order to try to affect change that way because we were just seeing people that were completely resistive to what we were trying to accomplish. Um, uh, I talked about our statistics. Um, a little bit difficult to see. I'll try to talk through this slide a little bit. Um, Early on, there's a bunch of different ways to measure homelessness in your community. So right now, for those of you familiar, we have a point in time count. So uh, the point in time count is uh, once a year in January, uh, 
organizations go out and they try to count the amount of unhoused people that we have in our community um, over uh, in a short, very short period of time. It takes, it's supposed to be like overnight, but it really takes about a week to kind of coordinate that and get, it's a big undertaking. We participate in that with them and just kind of driving them around to kind of help them get into areas. Uh, we're not doing the count ourselves, but we've been involved in it and I've seen how it's happened. Um, so there's that, there's a bunch of other ways to kind of count that. We decided we want to have our own statistics that we feel are accurate from our perspective. And this is nothing against the point of time count. Um, I feel that anytime that you, anytime that you attach money to a number or a survey or a count, I question how accurate it is. Uh, the more people you have homeless, the more money that the county gets. Um, not the county itself, but the more money comes towards homeless services in the county. So, uh, just give me just a second. Yeah. So we decided, look, I want, we want, kind of want to separate from that and count in a, in a different way so that we have an understanding. And we don't want to count people. We're just going to count camps. We're going to count how many camps that we actually have, how many established, I don't like using the word established camps after the last couple of weeks, uh, but how many actual camps that we have in the city in our public spaces. So the point in time counts count people that are couch surfing. It counts families. It counts people in, in cars, uh, RVs, motorhomes, so on and so forth. We were just looking at camps within the city. So we developed that app and we started camp accounting them. And we would send out a livability team officer and the entire team would go out over the course of about three days. They would put themselves in the middle of the camp. They would geolocate it. They would capture some data, but we weren't capturing data about people. We were just capturing camp location data. And now we do that every six months. And we've continued that since September of, of 2019. And we thought this will give us a gauge of where the community's at. It will give us a, and it's not perfect. Uh, um, uh, I completely recognize that, but I think our margin of error was pretty low when you look statistically at the accuracy uh, of the counts. So go ahead, before I get into the numbers. Yeah, yeah no, I, I'm just, the, the only thing I see was statistics and having a, just marking a certain point is it's only reflective of that point. So I love that you guys are doing it every six months, but I also hear that you are daily, weekly getting data about these camps. Is there a way or have you thought about tracking it on a more accurate basis rather than just a one point in time? Yeah, so we're, what we're trying to do with the six month counts is just get a snapshot every six months, right? So we're just trying to get a snapshot to be able to compare because there's a lot of factors in there like a September count and then a March count, you're going over the winter months. And then a March count to a November or September count, you're going over the summer months. Like how is, how is the weather, how is the environment going to affect those counts? Um, I, I totally, I totally get that, and I totally understand that. There's definitely some issues with that. We do, uh, in our prohibited camping operations, we use the same app with a slightly different platform, platform to to manage where we have posted and the camp that we posted, who we talked to, and pictures of that particular camp. So, if you go on Monday and you talk, you talk to people in that camp, and you post their camp, you take a photo of it, you mark who you talked to, you mark some of the barriers, and then you mark what resources you've actually provided to that person. So you have documentation of that. Um, that's what we're using the app, but we're not using it to track the statistics of, of the people necessarily. We have a lot of data, um, but, but mining that data is a little bit difficult. I'm glad you're coming back to the point in time. You mentioned it earlier. I first saw the first one in 2019 and you gave a number of 781. I think that was the figure. But to solve the problem, you have to know the why. I wish there would have been some more documentation on some history on why they're there, there whether they were truly homeless, traveler comforts, no rules, no regulations, or strictly drug related, or have warrants and they're running, or resources are available near here, which is why it's comfortable, the weather's nice, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, we can do what I do when I want to do it with no recourse. Yeah, and I, I think to answer your question is that there will be people that answer yes to all of those things you said. That's true. Right? There will be people who, like, yes, all of these things apply to me. Um, I think it's very difficult. And A, then your, your self-reporting is not a, a historically accurate measure as well, because then you're asking for someone to self-report. Um, you're asking for someone who, um, and this is not a, a, it's not a hit on them. But a lot of these folks' lifestyle has been lying and cheating and stealing their whole lives. That's what they know. That's how they were raised. 
in a circle of like, so how accurate are you getting that stuff from them? So it's very difficult. Uh, and I do know that the point in time does count a bunch of different things. Like how long have you been here? Like where, like what, what kind of homeless are you? Are you couch surfing? Are you unsheltered <laughs> in the elements out? Uh, they do capture a bunch of different things, and why but the why is very you're from and why you're now here. Actually, yeah. it does capture some of those things. The so people, one minute. But the people can choose not to answer I them. see. Okay. okay. Yeah. We're, community Works is involved in the point in time camp mm -hmm. because we have shelter and, right. and transitional housing. And, and those questions are there. They are. But they can, but to your point, whether or not they choose it or how they choose to answer it, but there's a lot of good data mm -hmm. that comes from it. There's right. just not enough because there are homeless right. people that we aren't able to capture. Right. Right. Because they may not be in those strong areas. That's, That's thank you. Um, uh, uh, you're probably going to get to this, but what, how do you account for the tripling between September and March? Yeah, I'm curious about That's a great too. question. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's talk about these numbers and so I can answer this. September 2019, and I'm looking at, so if we're looking at the green bar, Right, I'm just going to look at the green bar. Uh, the, the, the gray bar is total camps. The green bar is active camps. That means a camp that is actively being lived in. Um, and you can tell pretty apparently whether a camp is being lived in or whether it's been vacated. Um, and then inactive camps. So trash piles, it's clearly not being lived in. The tent's dilapidated. There's nothing inside the tent that looks like sleeping bedding material. It's pretty easy to determine kind of what those are. So I like to look at the active camp numbers. So how many active camps you, you have it in a one or two day period. So in September 2019, we were at 145 active camps in the city of Medford on public spaces. Um, and, I, and I think some private property spaces that are hard to differentiate between public and private property spaces. Like there's a lot of space on the Greenway that's actually privately owned that we would still count because it's so, uh, it's so vegetated that it really just acts like it's public property. Um, so we went from 145 and the livability team kind of doing its thing and other factors and so on and so forth to March of 2020 to 97 camps. So you almost have to, not quite. Um, again, not a smart guy, numbers are not my fit. However, we did, we did go down quite a bit um, in that six month period. However, something happened in March of 2020, uh, <laughs> a couple of different things. And this is what I was talking about, that, that perfect storm. So you have Measure 110 pop up in early 2020, right? So, yeah. February. February of 2020. You have Measure 110 happen. You have COVID come on February, March 2020. Uh, you have the Boise uh, and the Grants Pass case laws happen right about the same time. So all this, this, this whirlwind of things and this perfect storm of, si of situations happen. And we go from 97 active camps to 166. We didn't get a September of 2020 count because the county was on fire um, and we were all working that and we didn't go and then we had to deal with a situation in Hawthorne Park on the back end of that we didn't get our camp our count going until November of 2020. Um, so six months later March of 2021 we're at our highest that we've ever seen 181 active camps in the city and that's early March of 2021. Then we enact the new prohibited camping statute, a new program for how we're going to enforce that, uh, the, how that operation is going to work. And we drop it from 181 down to 109, and then within a year, drop it down to 78. Our lowest that we have seen, that we had seen to that point, it was in March of 2022. And that's a year after doing this prohibited camping model of outreach and enforcement. Um, that was huge. In, in, in police work, you typically don't see decreases in the, these amounts in a year in almost anything that you do. Um, that was huge. And I was really proud of the team for doing what they did. Um, then you get into these, these numbers and, and I'm just going to fall on my sword a little bit. A, that September of 2022 should have an asterisk. I don't think it's accurate. I do not think that was an accurate count. Um, and that's on me. Um, I think that these numbers, uh, I don't think that it was prioritized the way that this count should have been prioritized during that time um, by the people who were doing it. Um, but again, that's on me. These numbers, I believe, are accurate. Um, so 
so that you guys know, our, our team right now is led, the livability team right now is led by, by Sergeant Jason Antley. For those of you who know Jason, um, he's a stud. He's an absolute 10, and he is out there absolutely getting after it every day. He is learning this business. He is, he is very efficient and effective in what he does. And I know that that March of 2023 counts out because Jason went out and did it himself and supervised it and made sure that it happened and took everybody and prioritized it and did a great job. Um, so we jumped up to 164 active active camps and I think it was because he counted them. Um, I trust these numbers a lot uh, because I was there in the field for them. Um, I screwed up on those numbers probably. Um, the, um, the increase there, I think that was, that was on our, our team at the time. I think that the makeup of our team for that, that period of nine months to a year um, wasn't good. I think that we had some leadership issues on that team, and, uh, but we got those fixed. Um, I, but I do think that that is a really telling thing that if you don't have a, uh, a proactive, engaged, and group of people who care about what they're doing, you'll see this. Um, you'll see those numbers increase. Um, I can tell you right now, uh, and we were just in a meeting before we came over here, uh, and I said the same thing, I can get a good base of what our homeless population looks, looks like just on my daily drive every morning. Uh, and I typically, on my way to work every day, I come a certain way to work and then I get downtown and then I do a few different laps and circles of things, and I've done it for years. I always go to the same places and I look at the same things. And I do it almost every day that I come to work because I like to get a gauge of how we're doing. Um, and I can tell you that right now our numbers are pretty low. Um, as far as established camps. Um, that doesn't mean anything like the numbers of, you know, our homeless numbers. It just means that our established camps um, are pretty low right now. Um, I would say, I would venture to say probably in this area of the 78, of the 78 that we have. And I think that that's a reflection of the team that's doing it. Right now. Um, some statistics from our prohibited camping enforcement. So these are stats from May 3rd of 2021 to today. We have cleaned 1,664 camps from our public spaces in the city of Memphis um, in just over two years. So averaging around 800 camps a year. So when the citizens are like, why aren't you guys doing anything? That's a big number. That's a big number. 800 camps a year is a big number. Um, the amount of camp occupants uh, that we've contacted, 1,652, again, a lot of those are repeat. Um, another thing that uh, I want to really point out, um, our relationship with our parks department, and specifically a, a small group of our parks department and our contract services that we use for the cleanups, um, they're incredible. And we have cleaned almost 2,500 cubic yards of garbage um, from our public spaces, from our greenway in that time. Now, 2,500 cubic yards. Um, this room, Travis can probably correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm looking at dumpster space and so on and so forth, but uh, 30 yarder, probably 150 to 200 cubic yards of trash. 200 cubic yards of trash in this room. So 25, Close to 2,500 25 cubic yards of trash from our greenways. That's staggering. It's a staggering amount of trash that we have removed. And if you look at those pictures, that's just one day's worth of work, or not even a day's worth of work um, for our folks. Um, they're doing a lot of work. Um, I cannot imagine, and this is one of the things that I say pretty frequently, I cannot imagine what things would look like without our livability. I don't think that anybody in this room can comprehend what that would look like without them, out, without them doing what they're doing. Um, one of our biggest resources, one of the biggest things that we have, because the Martin v. Boise, and I'm not going to get super legal into this because Doug will, have, will, will get me later. Um, the, uh, in order to enforce certain aspects of our prohibited camping ordinance, you have to have some things in place for your community to be able to go. Um, 
So we established, the city established the, the urban community campground in late 2020, but it really didn't kind of get off its feet till early 2021 with our prohibited camping enforcement. Um, but we have referred or taken uh, almost 2,000 people to the urban campground in that time frame and cycled people through. Uh, Road Retreat keeps statistics, we keep statistics of kind of how, where people go um, and um, what they're exited for, um, where they transition to. Road Retreat's model is you have uh, like a ladder of services, right? So you have a, the, the, the temporary or the, it's not temporary anymore, the urban community campground is the kind of lowest rung on that ladder. And then you work up to, you've got the Kelly Shelter, Navigation Center, um, individual living, so on and so forth. Um, but so the bottom rung of that ladder with very low, low barrier um, is the community campground where we can get people in uh, with a simple phone call and it's, we can get people in all day. Um, they're usually at capacity or close to it, but it's, it's uh, pretty frequent that every day we're moving people off the grid. Um, and then trying to get services to them while they're there. Uh, questions on that stuff? Yes. So uh, if you take the last two numbers, it looks like half of them voluntarily don't, or they don't stay. Mm -hmm. Why Why wouldn't they stay? Why don't they want to stay? Um, you know, it's, a, it's a bunch of different, I mean, sometimes it doesn't work for them. It's individualized, right? So it's, uh, it's for some folks, it's not like I talked about earlier. It's they were comfortable in the lifestyle that they were living before. Um, it didn't work for them. Uh, they didn't like it there. Um, some people, I mean, if you look at Look at freedom, right? So you you have this, uh, you're living out on the greenway, you have your tent, you have your, your significant other or your pet or, or whatever, and you are active in your addiction or you are um, happy with your standing life, and you have freedom. You have this, this ability to feel like you're free. And then you move to an urban campground, it doesn't feel free. And I think that, that's a, that that's, that's a difficult thing for some people, right? Um, so I think that there's a I think that there's a portion of that. There are rules at the urban campground. There's only five of them, uh, and they're pretty easy to do. Don't fight with anybody. Don't steal people's stuff. Don't disrupt it. Don't use drugs or alcohol while you're in the facility. You can get loaded and use outside, but don't use in the facility. Yeah. Go ahead. You had a question. Yeah, you know, I, we work with people every day in all of our different centers, and so I've dealt with a lot of people who have come back from going to the campground and thinking that would be an option for them, and then realizing, um, you know, like you mentioned, a dog can be their only form of family, and they won't always accept animals, and so that's the only person that's ever. If you have a dog that bites people, you're not going to be able to keep it. Well, yeah, but even then, there's dynamics within every community, and so there's existing tensions that mm -hmm. can happen, and so I think. Having an option is amazing, but having multiple different options that allow for different communities to have that support, I think will yeah. enable a lot more success in the future. Uh, we have a lot so, of that's some level you have to be kind of the taxpayers. What does this cost? And why am I negotiating on a dog being in there? It's, it's some level silly. Like we can't, it, it just, it, you know. You have options. Like the options so are, options. These, like, these options for housing, fix your substance abuse issues. Fix your, mental, fix your mental health, I mean, you can't fix mental health issues, but, in, but involve yourself in in treatment for those things. I promise there are you options. I'm not overlooking the human side of all of this, because I'm not. But like, you, you put dollar value to these numbers, it's astronomical. Somebody's paid for it. And it's 20 it's, million it, it is in the last five insane, the money. I mean, I asked it before you, when you were here a few years ago, I asked the city of Ashland, Chief Lamera, I asked Scott Clausen, I asked Chair Sickler, of your calls, how many of your calls are homeless related? It's, you know, it's probably 50 to 70 percent. Think of the resources, the dollars that we're throwing at it. It's outrageous. I had a homeless guy in front of the house the other day who was not well, and four, four fire trucks show up, and two policemen, and it's just one. It, it, the, the dollars are outrageous. But I'm negotiating on the dollar. I'm not gonna. Like, I don't understand why that's our hiccup. I just don't. Like, I, I can't. I can't wrap my as a citizen. Can't wrap my mind around it. It doesn't yeah. make sense. Well, and I want to validate that, Travis, because on the back end, we end up paying so much more in hospitals yeah. and police and having multiple different agencies come and wrap around. So then, how do we 
facilitate for those needs That's so true. not they're not continuing to have to go through the system to yeah. get but I think if we see the numbers of where they're being successful, it's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Oh, sure. There's always going to be, there's always the bell curve in everything, education, you name it. And there's a bell curve. And we, what you were saying, we, we chip away at that, the, the majority of it, and then those that we are not able to, then we address, we keep addressing, we keep trying, we keep moving forward. Um, and you're right, the cost is prohibitive. When I looked at the tons and tons you're talking about, I was curious to know how much per ton is it costing us as taxpayers to have you all do to have the parks and recreation do that? Just in our cleanup? Just yes. just the just cleanup. The itself, cleanup. Two hundred thousand dollars a year in just cleanup? Yeah. And then that's that's just in the work. That's contracts with uh, we have a contract with a with a contractor who does a lot of our handwork. Right. Uh, that doesn't include the uh, the parks and that, that, that is just in contract services and, and what we pay to road disposal for dumpster rentals. And road disposal is incredible. They give us like 20 to 30 a year in free 30-yard dumpsters. They're like, that's a lot of money. They're like 700 bucks a pop, 650 bucks a pop. And they give us a bunch of donations. We'll run through uh, uh, their 20 donations in, in, the, in January. Yeah. We're done. In February, we're paying for dumpsters. We pay as a police department an inordinate amount of money in cleanup. So that's that's not counting the. the that doesn't the count wages. That doesn't count fuel. That doesn't count equipment. That that just count. That's just we spend two hundred thousand dollars a year in contract services with the contractors that do the handwork, while the parks department does the transport of it. I'm guessing it's one and a half times more with the. The city has spent twenty million dollars in the last five years on homeless services. So that's about a hundred. I, you know, I think it, it definitely comes back to what you're talking about. Some of the outcomes would be better, costs would be uh, decreased with just accountability and consequences. And if we could have you know, that in, in our policy, um, we could take a little from the from my, from my perspective, Rick, that's where we see, a, that's where we see effect, is consequence. That's, and, and that has been my, that's why we went with the jail bed thing. That's what we, you have to have, there has to be a consequence. I'm friends with a lot of addicts. Uh, uh, I was on the board of Road Retreat. I, I know a lot of people in that community. I'm not friends with a lot of them. And two, and in my really candid conversations with them over the years, almost every single one of them has told me that the reason that they got clean was consequence. Consequence. So, yeah. I have a question. Yes. Yes, go. <laughs> I'll zoom. There you go. Um, so, speaking of costs, you know, we have this fixed cost of, of cleanup and enforcement and outreach. How many of these camps do you feel like when you go into them have evidence of other criminal activity that maybe goes unreported or it's unsolvable, such as theft, uh, you know, other things? Do you have any idea or anecdotal number you can throw out there? Sure. Pre-measure 110, every single one of them. But now, uh, because there's drugs in almost every single one of them. Almost. Uh, that, that, there is drug activity in almost every camp that we walk into. Um, the uh, theft and other things, there's a lot of unreported crime. Um, one of the things that keeps me up at night is the uh, is the amount of victims that we have out on our greenway, mm. in, in our in our public space, uh, the, the the particularly in our in the female population. Um, there's a lot of victimization happening out on the greenway amongst that amongst that community. Um, trying to, to bridge those relationships has been has been really difficult and has been really uh, something we're, we're trying to prioritize. Um, I don't have, I mean, like if you look simply from a, a fire perspective, there, uh, the camps we've cleared, 500 of them have been documented to have fire pits. That's criminal activity, right? Um, drug paraphernalia, 603 of them. I would say that the vast majority of the camps have evidence of some type of criminal activity, though can we tie it or make a probable cause arrest? Um, not necessarily on all of them, but. 
stolen bikes, bike frames, uh, people's property that you just can't pin to a particular report, mm -hmm. a, a lot of it. That probably ties into the lack of success rate right? and you're wanting to stick around as well. What do you mean? Well, if there's uh, criminal activity and continued theft or things that aren't reported or aren't being talked about, then when somebody's trying to better them, their life and they're still having their stuff stolen, it doesn't really empower them to do something different. Right. Um, yeah, they're all victimizing each other. There's another question. I mean, like you show a community campground, mm -hmm. oh, it's so nice, right? Um, I, you know, up in Eugene, like I go, I go run on the trail, I run off the greenway around the yeah, yeah. yesterday, right? And so, um, not that it's like uh, the problem solved by any means, Eugene, I'm not claiming that way, right? but like when you run on the paths there, like it's a tent and they have all their stuff inside their tent, right? When I run on the paths here, there's a tent and then there's a tarp. And then there's a trash pile, and there's another trash pile, and there's another trash pile, and more stuff thrown around, right? So, I mean, it depends obliterating. I mean, it meets the criteria there. You get is part of your enforcement, is that part of what you're doing, or what's going on in that well, way? Here's, here's part of the issue is that you can't squeeze blood from the turn. Yeah. So I can go and give somebody a citation for, for, for offensive littering, which is a violation. Here's your citation. Uh, what if you don't pay? There's no consequence. Same thing with Measure 110. You don't pay it. You don't go to treatment. There's no consequence to that. So there's, I can't take them to jail because they're going to have to be forced released. There's no consequence there, even on criminal stuff, let alone the amount of people who we cite for violation things that just don't pay. You're going to take their driver's license away? They don't have one anyways. Like, it doesn't matter. There's no consequence. So giving somebody a $250 fine for prohibited camping just does not provide any benefit. Uh, we can do it, but it, it doesn't motivate people to change that behavior. You will see less of that with the fact that we have now s uh, defined what a established camp is because they're not going to have time to set those camps up and make them into giant trash piles anymore. Because we're, what we're going to try to do is, and we'll talk about some solutions moving forward, what we're going to try to do is we will have areas documented and if something pops up, we'll just be on it. We'll be able to empower our patrol officers to be able to do that. Uh, our livability team is going to be on top of it. We are doubling that livability team this year. Uh, we got funding for that earlier in the year. It's just the, the ability to actually take cops off the road and into the livability team. We have to backfill those positions first. So probably by August, we should have the team doubled and we'll be able to uh, affect a little bit more change. I think that this, this conversation in six months from now looks a little bit different. Yes, sir. Okay. So knowing you got to wrap it up pretty soon, I just I think I have one. So first of all, because we have a relationship, thank you. I know the not only just the work, but I know the personal toll and the frustration I've seen. So I just want everybody to know that this has been tough at times. Um, and I should have asked you this question before, but as you leave, this is a group in this room that represents a lot of different assets. Like, what's the one thing that you wish? Is it legislative help? Is it a resource itself? Like what could we do collectively as a community to help with the situation? You know, so that's a long conversation and a lot more, a lot more, uh, there's probably you and I over a, over a beer to talk about that a lot more, but, uh, or multiple. The, um, it's, it's all of those things. So legislative help is a big one, right? I, I, I think that we, as a, as a livability team, we as a police department, especially working in the in that homeless realm, have just been kicked in the shins over the last four years legislatively, every three or four months. We feel like something's going. There's a, uh, whether or not it even gets passed, but you see bills get introduced and you're like, my community's gonna fall apart. You know, we've got cops that are like, I don't wanna be a cop here anymore. I, wanna work in, I don't wanna work in Oregon anymore. What is happening? Legislative help is a big one. Uh, resource wise, we have a ton of resources. It's a double-edged sword from my perspective on if you build it, they will come, right? I think that there is an aspect of that. If you, the city of Medford has more problems than anywhere else in the county because the city of Medford has the resources. I, I, I firmly believe that. Um, that's where the jail is. It's where, the, it's where all the resources are. It's where road retreat is. It's where access is. It, all of these places, uh, community justice centers here, that like all of these things uh, are in our city. So we bear the brunt of that. Um, I think that if, if other cities had all of these resources, they would see a, we would see a, 
we would see uh, kind of an across the board. Um, you would see some of our folks go there. You would see some of their folks come here. Um, that's a part of it too. I think that there's an aspect of it. And I think that people are starting to see, like we're done providing this because it's just inviting more. I think that there's a big part of that. Um, and I think there's legitimacy to that. So um, legislative help is huge. Um, like just, yeah, I think that would be my answer. Um, I have a question. Yes. This is Hilda Montenegro Fix on Zoom. And you mentioned um, that you had had great success at this stage and then things changed. And I'm just curious what great success looks like, especially from, you know, the perspective of the people that, that are, you know, the homeless people. Well, I don't know what's, I mean, success for the, I can't speak to that because I'm not a homeless person. Um, I, I can't say what success looks like to them. Um, I can say that what success looks like from our from our community who demands certain things, it looks like less people in our public spaces. Um, it looks like less trash in our in our creek. It looks like uh, less violent criminals in our parks. Um, that's what the public uh, expects is success. It's difficult for me to say what success looks like for the individual. I think that each of those individuals out there measure success in a different way. We can't put a square peg in a round hole. Like we can't believe that every single one of them have the same set of circumstances. Um, so I think it's that's very difficult to um, to define. But I can speak for the for the community who demands certain things of us because we answer to them. Um, and when you mentioned success, like was there anything towards people being housed or people going into treatment successfully? Oh yeah, lots and lots and lots. But again- um, Like a percent, do you have a percentage, an idea or- Well, I, mean, I don't track- the, numbers, the recent numbers look pretty high again. Yeah, I don't, tr I don't track that. As a police department, I don't track where they go from, from us, right? I track how many people we get connected with resources, but I can't tell you, nor am I privy to, uh, somebody going into long-term substance abuse treatment because that's not something that's shared with me nor should it be as a police department right so i don't get that i don't get that um information so i don't have statistics on like what success looks like long term i do have a lot of friends karen's story was one of the people in there uh karen is somebody that i'm pretty close to i i know a lot of people in that exact same boat as her that i've seen uh a lot of success out of so there's a lot of people not Karen's just an example, but there's a lot of people out there just like her who are doing really productive things as a result of the work of that, that livability team. Yes. One more comment, then I promise I'm done. I appreciate your just continued um, ability to answer my questions and be open to that. Of course. So um, when we look at outcomes, I always think that as we recognize addiction as a mental health, uh, behavioral health, wraparound service needed kind of idea, uh, connecting our police force with behavioral health people is a huge piece of that. When we look at the outcomes and legislative outcomes on a larger scale, we can see the impact of what it does when we have someone making healthier life choices and getting into additional services that increase their health. Mm -hmm. We see a reduced cost in all other areas, right? So I guess when we look at outcomes and moving forward in the future, is that a way, a direction that the police force is moving in and recognizing that it's we all have to come together with behavioral health, with mental health, with community nonprofits, with the police force, with community justice, and all of us working, not as silos, but as the strong units we are together. And we've been doing that for years. I think that's so the chop, that's what the chop is. It's a multidisciplinary approach at a holistic view of the individual, and it's mental health, substance abuse treatment, it's medical health, it's uh, community justice, it's uh, attorneys, it's the, the our municipal court judge. It's a group of like 70 people in a room case managing individuals. And and we've we been doing that for years. Measured outcomes. Yes. Yeah, but it's difficult to measure those outcomes sometimes. Right, but that could be a way to show the power and the benefit that we are and have actively been doing yeah. and how we can build upon those in order to create more accountability and future success. And outside of the job, at least 10 years going back, 
we've sat in the same rooms with all of those resource providers you talk about in law enforcement and discussed those those intercept points where we can all help and bring resources to people who are criminal justice involved or utilizing emergency services. Right, and I, th I think we're seeing the pro pro progression of that action, right? Um, but I think there's still yeah. progress to be made. As we yeah, community justice has been doing that forever. Mm -hmm. Forever. That's valid. That's the whole purpose part. Fine. One thing I'd like to just add is, you know, you, you said that the consequences are necessary, and it's not just anecdotal. There's research that supports and has for a long time in community justice work that consequences combined with social services creates the biggest impact we have in changing mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. So you're spot on. And so I appreciate, you know, legislation as your suggestion, but, you know, just locally being able to impose a consequence and realistically, that consequence lots of times is removing that person from that situation for a short period of time, giving us that teachable moment opportunity to insert those services in their lives. And so I just, what you're providing anecdotally is research-based and we have really lost that ability. And thank you so much for saying that because you just put the words in my mouth that I was thinking. Like that, we need to hold people accountable as a community. Like we have to, because it, <laughs> I'm, I've watched it in person not work any other way. Every now and again, you'll hug somebody into services, but it's very rare. We were just speaking with a livability team. We call that extrinsic motivation, right? We have to have those external factors impacting that behavior so they can intrinsically make that change on their own. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not saying lock them up for 60 days or 100 days, five, seven, 10 days, enough to intercept right. and integrate services into that person. Yeah. That's one of the that's things we're yeah. doing with our community court that program is we're getting somebody sober enough that they can actually have a coherent conversation with you so you can start to affect change uh, on, a, on a short term. And we're working with community justice right now to work on some other things too. Um, so. Community court has like eight beds now, right? Correct. Yeah. Done. I just want to say it's pretty common that lacking data forward and letting people just um, know what truly what we're facing. They, I think a lot of people are just a little bit blind to the actual volume of um, what these folks are dealing with. And again, I commend you and, and uh, just, just outstanding presentation. If you guys need anything, uh, just because I'm transferring roles doesn't mean that I'm going to be able to step completely out of this realm uh, anytime soon. Uh, I think that I'll probably still be heavily involved with it for a little bit because it'll be hard to let go. If you have questions, you need to reach out to me. My contact information's on there. If you need to talk to the livability team directly at the bottom of that slide, the 2282 number, that will get you to Michaela, uh, who would, will dispatch you to whoever you need to talk to, the ability team wise. But my email and my, my desk number are on that slide if you need to follow up. Uh, so if you have, I can't remember the number right now, 164 active camps, mm -hmm. if you magically could have 164 single family houses and move each camp into one house, would that take care of it? Or no. No. Now, Sorry. is it a zero sum game? Of what you have to do, and what we've, what, and again, research supports this, but also I've seen it happen personally because I've wasted money doing it, is moving people in without support, without having something set up on the back end, without having wraparound services, without having the ability to manage themselves within that house, right? So you have to have all of those things working in order for that person to be successful in that home, right? If we don't, if we don't, treat the reasons why they're homeless in the first place and we just move them into a home, they're just going to be homeless again. All right, well, let's put it a, a different way. If you wave the magic wand and, and all 164 were moved to Wyoming, then what? Are we going to get another 164 in the next year, or is that it? Ah, that's tough. I, I mean, I think that we see a lot of influx, and this is nothing, something that we didn't hit on. This may start a conversation um there's a lot of influx into our community from outside the area and we've started tracking that a bit i'm guessing and if i look at our statistics i'd have to i didn't bring those with me i think like 50 50 to 60 percent of the homeless people that we counted at one point in time were from outside of our area we are import they are they are coming here i don't know why i, I don't i think that we could all speculate as to different reasons but they're, they're, they're coming here. Um, 
just solving the you know waving the wand and solving the homeless issue here wouldn't solve it anywhere else, and it would just continue to. Um, I think that anywhere along, I think that we in Jackson County and in the, in the city of Medford doing pretty well compared to other West Coast places. Like I really, I mean, I think we need to at least count those blessings a little bit because I, I go elsewhere and we're doing okay. It's not as good as it first, I mean, depending on how you measure good. It, it, it may not be as clean or, or livable on our greenway or our public spaces as it once was, but it's much better than it could be. We are at least three years in front of a lot of cities uh, with Correct. teams like this and programs and services that we're providing. It's, you know, we'll go to Chiefs of Police Conference, uh, they can talk to the Sheriff's Association. There's a lot of areas around the state that are now playing catch up. This team is a model uh, throughout the state of Oregon on truly an option on how to, to deal with these issues. And uh, we've had multiple agencies come down, ride uh, with, with this team, and decide, like, how are you guys doing? And so I, to answer your question, I think we're, we're out in front of this as best we can. Um, I think what's great is there's a lot of people that take pride in it. I mean, a lot of folks that are sitting in this room grew up in this valley and uh, have, take a lot of pride in what we're doing. And, to answer your question, if we can get someone into services, that is the most efficient way to solve this problem. Uh, trust me, we yep. look at that. That's the goal. That is the goal because you will be money ahead if you can get that person stabilized um, in the long run. And uh, But unfortunately, sometimes you, it takes some accountability to get to that point. Yeah, measure 110, unfortunately, just didn't do us any favors. <coughs> Well, thank so, you. Yeah, absolutely. Great, That's great all presentation. Got. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Does anyone have anything else before we close the meeting? Okay, we'll see you in June. Meeting's adjourned.